Welcome to my soul for another in our series of interviews. We're delighted to welcome Stuart Gosgrove. Hello there, good Hi. to be here as well. So, so Stuart, um, you're a very successful media exec. You've got a very um, a big job at Channel 4. You've won BAFTAs, you're a broadcaster. Um, you're, you've been a journalist, a long career in journalism. Yeah. Um, you do radio. However, I don't want to talk about any of that sort of stuff. Great. <laughs> You're also very prolific on the soul scene. Yeah. So I wanted to start the journey with how your sort of passion for soul came, where it came from, how it started. Yeah. Obviously, growing up in Scotland, yeah. you know, the soul scene. So mm. talk me through that. Okay, talk me through so that. probably the best place to start was uh, my life as, as a teenager. Um, I lived in a housing scheme in Scotland. It's called Letham, and it's one of the biggest housing schemes in central Scotland. And at the core of the housing estate was a, a community centre, which is just a post-war brick building where people went to do things like play pool and snooker and table tennis and bingo and all of that typical kind of community hall of the era. And on a Saturday night, they had a disco. And the DJ at the time was playing records, many of which were uh, records from the city of Detroit. It was the height of Motown. The Gordy Empire was probably at its great kind of phase. So if you look back to kind of 67, 68, it was the year of the Supremes, the Four Tops, the Elgins, Edwin Starr, Jimmy Ruffin, you know, Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, all of these great songs which were already breaking through into the British charts. So they were the kind of pop songs of, of, of the era that I was fortunate to grow up in. Um, and then um, as, I, as I kind of got more and more interested in the music, I started to realise that beneath the surface, I think this is actually quite a common thing in uh, the experience of African-American music or black music or uh, you know black British music, is that you get teased into it by something that you hear on the radio or by a pop record or whatever. And then once you become kind of consumed by it, you start to want more. And it's kind of like I, I had then got this kind of, you know, obsession with uh, black music, particularly the city of Detroit, but, but more broadly black music, and started to dig deeper and deeper. And inevitably that took me, um, in the first instance, to the northern soul scene, which was at the kind of uh, early cusp of its kind of uh, growth. The, the, the big t uh, club at the time was called the Twisted Wheel in Manchester. And there was another one which I was old enough to go down to which was um, called The Torch in Stoke-on-Trent, a place called Hanley in Stoke-on-Trent. And just as I moved down to the north of England, ostensibly to go to university, but actually to get me closer to the, that music, um, I ended up um, being in the north of England uh, coincidental with the rise of the Wigan Casino and Blackpool Mecca, which were, of course, two of the big kind of epicentres of the northern soul scene. And the northern soul scene is effectively the underground kind of 60s dance scene which kind of scratches beneath the surface of pop hits of the hits that have made it the hits that have got distribution distribution deals or whatever to find the kind of local soul record of the 60s and 70s and in that sense it's very much an indian underground scene and once I was in there, uh, this was like I'd fallen in love with this stuff because it was vinyl, you could find it in boxes, they were rare, they had this kind of holy grail feel about them and everything. And everything I kind of loved in life um, was, was given to me on that scene. You know? so I don't realise you were actually living in the north of England when the whole northern yeah. south thing, right, yeah. as opposed to... Is there, is there much of a scene in Scotland or was yeah, there much yeah, of a scene in Scotland? Yeah, enough, actually, the scene in Scotland, the northern scene in Scotland, there was a, very much a 60s soul scene in Scotland, but the northern scene come just, just soon after I'd left and moved to the north of England. Well, one of the things that was kind of curious is in the Scotland at the time that I was growing up, there was a guy in the south side of Glasgow called John Anderson. And John was um, distributing and selling records to collectors across the whole of the UK, but um, particularly in Scotland. He was operating out of his mum's flat, basically. He was surrounded by records under the bed and all the rest of it. And one of the things that was quite interesting at that time and uh, to give you a kind of um, perspective on it, was that Scotland had at the time, still does have actually, uh, the biggest, one of the biggest American uh, Polaris submarine bases. And it was in a place called the Holy Loch, which is just beyond Glasgow. Uh, and quite a lot of African-American sailors and, and uh, sub submariners and that were based in this area in a town called Dunoon. And often they would come into Glasgow 
uh, looking to buy records that were kind of, you know, coming into the charts in the States and R&B records. Sometimes they were running their own clubs. Sometimes they were also bringing records with them mm -hmm. and then selling them off locally to, you know, kids in, in, in Glasgow. So the first records that were kind of leaking into the Scottish soul scene were often coming from these uh, black sailors who were at the Polaris submarine base, now the Trident nuclear base in Scotland. And that was a kind of curiosity and there's also some talk as well that um, in those days that records, uh, if they hadn't sold well, were often used as ballast in ships, you know, to, to ballast the side of a ship. And then when the ship docked, they just chucked the records off of whatever they were delivering, <laughs> the bananas or whatever it was, you know, and the records would just be left lying in the dock. And certainly there's, there's kind of theories that that might have been one of the places that the Liverpool bands first heard of the R&B songs of the kind of early 60s and things like that, that it was a kind of dock relationship. But certainly there's no question in Scotland that the Polaris submarines had an influence on the local collector's market. And John Anderson, who later went on to become the owner of the very influential Soul Bowl Records in Kings Lynn, as a Scottish guy that moved south to England, he had clearly relationships with dealers in the States and with uh, local black American uh, uh, you know, sort of pioneers from the Polaris submarine base and whatever. And that was almost unheard of in those days because if you're going back to the very mid-60s, he then started to go on trips to America mm -hmm. to look for records. And that began a long 10, 15 year career of him finding records in America and selling them on to the rare soul scene and northern soul scene or whatever. You know. I mean, he was basically the, the provider of the music for the whole scene, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, very much so. I mean, <coughs> you know, what you had really is you had a lot of very, very knowledgeable um, collectors. And in lots of ways, the northern soul scene, whilst the DJs became famous, if you like, it was usually the collectors that were providing mm. the records for the for the DJs. And um, John would come back, and let's say that he, you know, he found records in Florida or in Baltimore or in Detroit or Chicago, and they were on small labels, maybe only three hundred copies had ever been pressed. He might come back with a hundred, and his business was to say, "How do I make this record big so that people will want it?" Because I've got another ninety-nine to sell, and the easiest way of doing it is to give the first record to the DJ to get the DJ to play it and make it big and all the rest of it. And you know that's often how how the whole thing came about. You know. So that that brings us to here. Yeah. You've just written a book. You've written yeah. other books before, but this is yes, the first yeah. soul-related book, it's isn't the it? It's the first full soul book of. Contributed to books and all the rest yeah. of it. Yeah, there it is in all its glory. It's a big beast of a book. Look how <laughs> thick that is. You break your teeth in it. It's Detroit 67, the year that changed soul. And if there's one influence of the kind of, if you like, the kind of media scene in here, this is the social history of the city of Detroit in the year 1967. And it's broken down into 12 chapters, which are the 12 months of the year 1967, from January through to December. So it has a very kind of smart, obvious kind of format, which is the months of the year. Mm -hmm. But within that format, that's the format that gives the reader something to kind of hang on to. There's layers of different kind of stories going on, that, some of which are musical, some of which are political, some of which are to do with the social culture of the city itself, some of which are kind of coming out of, most of which are coming out of African-American music, some of which are coming out of the rock scene. So it kind of takes this kind of tapestry across the 12 months, but the months themselves. And, and uniquely, you're combining lots of your skills. So your, yeah. your knowledge of soul music, music obviously yeah. your passion for, in this case, Detroit, yeah. your journalism background, yeah. Yeah. and your social history yeah. uh, studies. That's right. I mean, in lots of ways, I often refer to it to people as saying it's the biography of the city of Detroit in the year 1967, or I'll sometimes say it's the social history of Detroit in the year 1967, and it's very much that that's kind of... It's uh, not only soul music you talk about. No, I talk about MC5, the garage <clears throat> rock scene, the incendiary kind of, the so-called holy, holy rock barbarians of rock, who are a, a group of kind of uh, white Detroiters who are engaged in the anti-Vietnam war, they're, they're uh, involved in the legalised marijuana campaign, and they're kind of revolutionaries and often actually in some cases hardcore they end up two of them end up being in, in jail for blowing up the CIA headquarters in Ann Arbor in Michigan so there's a kind of a lot of stuff going on in their story alone um, but I've kind of my first love really is the uh, Detroit R&B and of course the Detroit soul scene so that's where you can tell and I, I said a little bias yeah you got, <laughs> a, 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 got quite a big bias I, mean, I, I think the other thing John that I did is I set myself two two rules and I stuck to one of them and slightly stuck to the other one. 
And the two rules were 1967 is by some distance the most significant and famous year in the history of Scottish football. <laughs> and I went, there will be no reference to Scottish football anywhere, right? Now, it's the year that Celtic became the first um, British team to win the European Cup. It's the year that um, Scotland beat England at Wembley just after em uh, England had won the World Cup. That was in 1966. You don't hear about it. I don't like, well, I know why they, why they don't talk about it more anymore. <laughs> anyway, so in 1967, Scotland had a great year of football. Because of my passion for football, people thought I would be getting to me in 1967 and mentioning Celtic. So it's like, finding a way yeah, to weave it. Way get it. But I ignored them all. And there was not a single reference to Scottish football in the entire book, which I'm very proud of. And the other thing I said to myself is I'm not going to go off on narrative detours to show off my knowledge of rare northern soul. <laughs> that's the one I slightly fail at a little bit because yeah. it's just too tempting. Yeah, there are yeah, yeah, there are a few references there. Yeah, when you go off and you think... <laughs> there was this label, this independent label yeah, yeah, in exactly. Detroit. <laughs> and it's, you know, but, but the reason I thought it's worth mentioning, you know... There's quite a few references to Shrine as well. Shrine so records. If you're a northern collector, it's a real... It's a big label, yeah. yeah. So Shrine... <laughs> Palmer, uh, you know, Riptic, Golden World, mm -hmm. I go through all of those labels, they get mentioned in some form or another. But that's a little bit of the nod to the fact that there's the guy that's going to read this book saying, mm -hmm. where's the rare stuff, you know? <laughs> and if you didn't have it, you, yeah. some people would feel let down, but there's just enough of it sprinkled over. No Scottish football, though. Band. Well, I mean, what I really enjoyed about the book, and I think is unique in sort of books within certainly the soul market, yeah. although it's broader than that, is is the, is providing that social history, the context of what yes. was going on at the time. Because yes. most of the other books that you read about soul is is more about the music, the releases, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It doesn't really tell you what life was like and what was going no. on and the background to it all. And, yeah. and 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 obviously, it's well documented all the politics that went on at, at Motown and all yeah. the different stories, and everyone's written their own stories. Mm. But this is quite a, an interesting sort of set back where not only do you do you put the context of what was going on socially but also yeah. what was going on for different people like Florence Bar Ballard, Ballard. There's, a lot, yeah, there's a lot of talk yeah. about her upbringing yeah. uh, like her, what her family life was like all that yeah. sort of stuff which yeah. puts into context so I thought it was very fair unbiased yeah. I actually made a decision to do that I'm glad, I'm glad that's how you read it because I made a decision to do that you know there's a really really interesting thing and it's kind of fragmented the history of Motown uh, and it's been quite a kind of influence on the gay disco scene as well. There are people who either love Diana Ross or hate her. Mm -hmm. She's very much that kind of Marmite, Marmite personality yeah. that divides opinion. And of course, if you hate Diana Ross, you somehow construct that she was part of a conspiracy to bring down Florence Ballard, to ruin her career, to ruin her life and all the rest of it. And whilst you can p place that interpretation on it, there's other interpretations you mm. can place on it. And I tried to be much more even-handed and say, look, you know, here are three young, you know, black women who have just gone through the most unprecedented period of travelling. And, you know, in 1965, I mean, they had more hits than any other group in the world. They were, by some distance, the most famous girl group in the world. And they were doing double, you know, they would fly out to Hollywood to be on a TV show and fly back to do a gig in Philadelphia the same night and then fly back again the next day. I mean, just an itinerary that would have ruined just about anybody. And they all were hospitalised at various times on the way. So I was trying very much to try and be honest with them. And I met um, Mary Wilson. She was over uh, to do a thing at the V&A, and I interviewed her on stage. And then uh, we went back to her hotel, in the platonic sense of going into back to her hotel <laughs> for a drink, uh, just in case that's misunderstood. <laughs> Actually, very nice if it was misunderstood. Um, and, she, and she started to share with me some of her thinking about it. And I think that once we got past the kind of there's a kind of trust level where once you get talking to somebody and you ask them questions that they find fascinating, they start to unlayer their version of the story. And I think that she'd been so used to just giving the cliched version to journalists mm. for 20 years. And uh, I talked to her about, first of all, the thing that kind of cracked it for her is, I, I said to her, tell me a little bit, and I mentioned this guy's name, who's a, I've forgotten his name off the top of my head now, he's a white Jewish um, teacher that worked with him, and he had been uh, Florence Ballard's uh, vocal coach. He was a school teacher, right? So she kind of thought this guy knows a little bit more than, you know, the passing the history. Yeah. So we got talking, and I said, what was the big difference? And she gave me what is effectively the, one of the chapters where she features quite heavily. She said, look, throughout my life, I've been caught in the middle. Um, 
I was born in the, she was born in the southern states, her family moved to Detroit and she was adopted by her aunt and then her mother tried to claim her back again and successfully got her back. Um, and uh, she always felt that even in family disputes she was being the person that was kind of fought over or she was caught in the middle of a fight and whatever. And as soon as the Supremes started to go downhill, she started to kind of get feeling caught in the middle, that if she set, sided with Florence it was against Diane and if she went, went for a drink down the lounge with Diane, Florence would think that they were talking about her and she just felt very dragged into it in that way. And there's a fantastic photograph which I use in the book, which is by a Chicago photographer called Art Shea and is taken backstage in Chicago at the Regal Theatre in Chicago, probably about 66. And Diana Ross is sitting at the front of the camera, looking directly at the camera. They're all in their stage glittering costumes. Uh, Florence Ballard's sitting side on, looking at Diana Ross. And it's quite a scowl. It's not a very pleasant look. It's almost like she's boring into the back of her head. And but at the back, looking in, in a mirror, is Mary Wilson looking away from the two of them. Oh, it's in and the book, putting on it? her yeah. makeup. Yeah. And it's all, you could write a PhD just on that image. <laughs> it's as if she's seen a story in, its, in itself. Girl, get over this. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't even know she's putting on the makeup or pretending to be putting on the makeup, but it's her way of not being caught in the middle uh, of these disputes. So it tries. So, so um, basically, uh, the I try to be very, very even handed. And I tried also to. Uh, ask another question, and this might be something you'd recognise this, John. Over the last 15 years, I've spent an awful lot of my professional time meeting producers. Producers that come with an idea, producers television and film, producers that come with a concept, or people that come and pitch something that they care about and they believe in, and they're trying to run companies, and they're trying to run you know, successful organisations that give talent a break and all the rest of it. And in lots of ways, Motown was like that. And because I've had a lot of responsibility for Channel 4's work out of London, you know, ironically, uh, the Motown Corporation in Detroit in the 60s and 70s was the most successful regional indie ever in history, you know. And so in lots of ways, I brought a lot of understanding of how creative companies work and how they, and how they try to seek network distribution and get projects funded and whatever. So I'm probably a lot more tolerant of Barry Gordy in the book mm -hmm, yeah. than any other uh, writer has been. In fact, I'm actually, some people say, well, you're very kind of pro Barry Gordy, but I'm trying to kind of turn around and say, I wonder, a lot of the books that have been written about Motown say, she's the heroine, he's the villain. Mm -hmm. She's the victim, he's the scumbag, you know? And I thought, I wonder if there's a book to be written which is all four of these people are uniquely brilliant and interesting yeah. in their own right. Yeah. They deserve their dignity. And there was something that um, Mary Wilson said to me, and it was one of these kind of moments where you think, oh, wow. She just said to me, uh, I got talking about civil rights, and she said to me, Diana, or Diana, she called her Diana Ross, was pursuing a civil right, the right to be as famous as any other white woman in the world. And I just thought, yeah, there's mm. some, something in that that she thought. Which you talk about in the book, yeah, don't you? About, that she actually had this belief that she could should have the right to be as famous mm. as any other white woman, and that's a fantastic right to stand up for. So although she was not a political woman, or although she was not part of the anti-Vietnam War movement or whatever, she was fighting her own civil rights war. The, the desire to be famous, you know. And I should point out, this is part of a trilogy, isn't it? Yes, it is. There's, yeah, there's two yeah. more books to come. There's two more books to come. They are Memphis 68, which is the one that's most developed and will come next. And that follows, it's framed by two significant deaths. The death of Otis Redding in the December of 1967 when he dies in a plane crash in Madison, Wisconsin, but he's at his height as an artist for the Memphis label Stax. And then the assassination in the spring of 1968 of Martin Luther King in Memphis, uh, the circumstances of which even to this day are disputed. But what's not what's b beyond dispute is that it's very much a story set in the city of Memphis, you know. So that's the next one. And then the third one's going to be Harlem 69, which is kind of going to be harder to research because it's about an entire weekend where a soul concert, which at the time was referred to as the Woodstock of soul music, was played out in Harlem. The police refused to police it, so the Black Panthers came in to provide security for the event. And if you look at the itinerary, Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin, and all the rest of it, it's one of the greatest group of soul musicians ever on stage over the weekend. So that that's the trilogy. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Stuart. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah.